big problems that I run into with uh, my bar and restaurant that I work at. One is obviously citrus. Citrus is one of the biggest wastes in a bar. We juice it or take the peels and then we get rid of it. Um, the second is, you know, working with the kitchen, looking at the stuff that they're wasting, there's a lot of stuff that can still be utilized as well. Um, so, to start with, the first cocktail I'm going to make for you guys, we're going to start with some Kettle One Citron, uh, which is distilled with four different types of lemon and two different types of lime. We're going to start with our beautiful Kettle One Citron, it's going to give us a nice citrus backbone to this. To that, we're going to add some Skinos, which is a Masia liqueur from Greece, and that has a nice anise and grassy flavor to it. Next, some citrus stock. So we've uh, juiced our citrus, our lime, and then have uh, made a stock out of that with a little citric acid, malic acid, um, boiled it down, and created a nice citrus stock. <coughs> Next, I took some strawberries and the lime husks from juicing that and made a strawberry and lime cordial. I then added a little bit of Kettle One Aranje to it to kind of fortify that. So we have a little strawberry and lime cordial. And then one of the waste products I found in our kitchen um, was from beets. We have a really nice heirloom beet salad. We you know, wash and peel them and then we throw the peels out. So I took those peels and some of the lime zest and I made a beet root and lime peel oleosaccharum out of it. Six minutes. We're gonna get this one moving for us. No mistakes can be made. <laughs> now we've got to keep moving past that. We can't just throw out those husks afterwards. So I took the beet peels after making the oleosaccharum, the husks and the strawberries <laughs> after they've been um, used for the cordial, they actually turn white. And I dehydrated all that down with a little Aperol and made a, a dust, a powder out of that. So this is now no longer. Every part of it has been used completely um, all the way down to that. So we're going to add our beet and lime husk. And this cocktail is called Without a Trace. Because now there is nothing left over from that. I'm going to move on to our second cocktail that we're going to use. Uh, Kettle One Original. Um, it's nice, crisp, clean um, taste to it, um, and a little tiny touch of citrus is a great backbone to build upon for a cocktail as well. Four minutes. To that, I'm going to add a little Encanto Pisco Muscatel. some Chiro aloe liqueur, which has some nice uh, mint and melony notes to it. Chiro. Chiro. Next, some fresh honeydew melon juice. Honeydew, that's a money melon. The money melon, absolutely. We're going to utilize the citrus stock yet again. <coughs> Then made a pandan infused coconut cream that we're going to add <coughs> to this beautiful combination as well. Now, after juicing the honeydew, we were left with all this pulp that was left over. So I took the pulp and some of the lime juice from juicing the limes, a little bit of sugar, and made <coughs> a honeydew leather out of it. And that's what we're going to use to garnish this cocktail. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
utilize the honeydew as well in multiple ways, as well as the citrus stock and the juice that we got from that. I want to not risk that extra cube right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, a few of them, but since this came up in world class, uh, definitely got the juices flowing and got me thinking outside the box um, where I started to go into the kitchen and see, you know, not just what I'm using and throwing away behind the bar, but what they're kind of wasting yeah. and using it, uh, which is where the idea from the beet um, peels came from. Yeah. So um, as a whole, when you work at a restaurant, not just a bar, you know, the kitchen and the bar were really well uh, intertwined together. So um, using what they're wasting or what I'm wasting completely is kind of the goal behind it all. Would you mind pouring a couple of the ingredients? The Absolutely. The citrus stock, the strawberry lime cordial, and the beet. I'd like the coconut too. And the coconut? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I put a lot of time into a lot of fun ingredients. I'd like to see, yeah, so see the, what they're doing in the cocktail. The pandan infused coconut cream. So Pandan, if you're familiar with it, uh, using a lot of uh, Southeast Asian desserts, got a nice coconut flavor to it. I'm sorry, almond flavor to it. And then this is just straight coconut cream. 20 seconds. Yes. Do you do anything with the pandan leaves after you infuse it into the? Um, I actually use the next extract for it, not the leaves. Yeah. Um, strawberry lime cordial. Okay. How many tries does it take you to tie a tie like that? <laughs> Quite a few. YouTube helps. Sure. And time. <laughs> Is that a question? Okay. I, think we were I don't know, but I like it. Which now is that? Uh, the Eldritch. Yeah. And then the beet peel and lime oil. I was just going to go over there, actually. I mean, YouTube helps humiliate those of us who can't. You know, it took a lot of uh, pause and play to uh, to get it down. The kid who does the. And then if you would like to taste some of the, uh, the dehydrated garnish, which is the beet peel. The lime husks, um, a little bit of aperol, and the uh, and the strawberries from the infusion as well, all, uh, all combined into that. having me. I'm John Howard. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and Diageo and everyone who was involved, thank you for having this challenge, forcing all of us to get really hands-on about how we limit our waste. Um, in my bar in Nashville, we are a 2% waste bar. And we only waste 2% of the things that walk behind it, so this is a way of life for us. Uh, our approach is we decide what story we want to tell, what thought we want to invoke. Uh, we create a concept around that, and then we circle back around and find the least wasteful way to do that. And that's how I approach this challenge. So if you look at my calendar at home, on the wall, I'm stating my age, I have a calendar on the wall. It says June 4th, block letters, travel to Louisville, world-class national final. Above it, much larger red letters, one year wedding anniversary, which was yesterday. So for this challenge, I wanted to give an homage uh, to my wife and to our wedding. Um, so I wanted to get married in a whiskey distillery, like most good bartender dudes do. She wanted to get married in a Caribbean social club, so we made a whiskey distillery uh, in Nashville into a Caribbean social club. Uh, and when I was looking through our wedding album to try to find like inspiration, what I want to tell, you know, story I want to tell about this, how do I make this happen, uh, there were two things that poked out of me. This pineapple centerpieces she made out of paper, uh, and then the little uh, coconut shell that the ring bearer brought us our rings in. 
Uh, so for this challenge, to tell that story, I'm gonna tackle one of the biggest, you know, wastes of things, and that's throwing away flavor. Not understanding that every piece of something in, in, in has flavor in it. Uh, and I've used every single inch of a pineapple and a coconut and a lime to create two drinks for you. I've, uh, I think it's dead here. Let me get it back open so you can look at it. But um, I have a diagram here so you can see how I used every part of every part of it. Uh, so first thing is in front of you, and I do apologize. I thought there were going to be two. So the very first thing I made uh, is a shrub. So this is going to be a shrub utilizing the pulp of the pineapple. It's utilizing the, the, the meat of the coconut uh, and the pineapple skins. The skins actually add a really cool rustic towar, sort of dirty flavor to it, which adds a whole other complexity. Uh, and then just a little bit of soda. So I use that for there. And then for half the half of the meat of the pineapple I didn't use to juice, I made some pineapple chips. These are things that you can make for your guests. They're free, they're easy to do. Um, it's stuff you already have anyway. You're using, if you use pineapple juice, these can be done. Uh, now the first drink. When my wife was sitting in the, uh, in the house, planning the wedding, she always had this concoction that she was drinking uh, that was ginger beer, pineapple juice, and coconut LaCroix. She's on that LaCroix life. Um, and so I wanted to make something to sort of emulate that. So this is called uh, the Planner's Potion. So we got a little bit of kettle one, some falernum for the citrus and spice. A toasted coconut uh, sweetener. So I took the inside of the coconut, what I didn't use for the shrub, I uh, uh, shredded out and toasted to use for this, uh, for this ingredient. Just add a bit of lime. Uh, and so talking about Kettle One, uh, created in 1691 uh, in Sheetham, Netherlands. Uh, Sheetham is a very interesting. Sheetham. 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 My bad. Sheetham, Netherlands. Um, I'm from the south, forgive me. And um, uh, there were 800 distilleries in that town uh, by 1800, which is kind of impressive if you think about it. Um, it's made from 100% winter wheat. It goes through a, a, a blending of a column distillate and a copper pot distillate, which gives you that really round, luscious mouthfeel, but also a really bright, crisp citrus, which is the whole point of Kettle One. Uh, and then the big ingredient, I guess, is this uh, ginger beer, which I created utilizing uh, ginger, the juice of the coconut, the juice of the pineapple, a little bit of brown sugar, lime, and champagne yeast. Some dehydrated limes. Very sustainable bamboo skewers that we get from our friends over in London. And then the rest of the coconut was toasted, just kind of throw in the top. Three minutes. You'll also notice that these glasses say Nolet Distillery because they used to be the bottom of Kettle One bottles. Uh, they're perfectly safe, sanded. You can use you can use a lid, but I would do recommend the straw. Uh, and so that's the planner's potion. Now the second drink. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. First dance, this is what we danced our first dance to. Sorry, I wanna do that. All right, so before I did anything to the coconut, I stuck Kettle One in the coconut and let it sit for about two weeks. So this is a coconut aged Kettle One with the uh, other bit of pulp of the pineapple, pineapple sweetener. Some macadamia nut liqueur for a little bit of nuttiness. Too nice. Of course, lime juice for balance and citrus. A couple dashes of mole bitters because uh, they're delicious. <laughs> I love it when that happens.
happens every time. <laughs> it never gets old. I guess it'll have to. Last one of these I'm doing, so it'll probably have to get old. And then to finish off, I could let the coconut shell go to waste. So we're going to use that to uh, house the drink here. Crushed ice because, because crushed ice. Also, the sand in this is not sand; it's two-day-old bread, uh, which I made into a made into a sand and kind of toasted for you. And this is the promise. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. I'm done, Jock. You're done. You're done, baby. <laughs> Interesting ways to impart flavor is always a big deal for me. Like, and um, I've done it with rum, I've done it with whiskey, uh, but the idea of being able to find a new way to impart flavor also adds a viscosity to it that you don't get just from normal like infusion, and it just rested. And the, it's 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 like a thing where I needed to pull the water because um, I needed to get the, the, the ginger beer to start. But I had this thing, and I didn't want to do anything with the thing yet. So, oh, I can put it inside. It's going to add flavor. You know, continue adding flavor. Don't waste. Don't throw away flavor. It's been, the, you know, a big part of kind of my whole ethos. The, the lime juice that you used was it repurposed lime juice, or was it just no? It's the fresh stuff here uh, because what I did, if I, I pretend like I was at my bar, uh, the limes then got the, the lime shells uh, were all pitted out, and then we used I used the lime in the uh, shrub as well. So I didn't waste any lime. Yeah, that, that starts and then I cut it open. The meat was toasted and used to the top here was also toasted and used for the sh for the, uh, the sweetener. Yeah, for the sweetener okay. and the shrub. Yeah, it was in all all all, all facets. I guess I used to touch on briefly, like uh, you said you're a two percent yeah, race bar. Yeah. Going into that more briefly, how do you achieve that? Well, the, the the main things are just doing little stuff like um, you know. No, no plastic straws uh, of any kind. We have four different kinds of sustainable washable straws. Dehydration of fruit so it never goes bad. We cut one lemon, one lime, one orange, and one grapefruit a day. That's all we cut. Gets us to a service. We're a busy restaurant bar. Um, we use our pineapple pulp to make sweeteners. We All of our juiced husks from limes and lemons go back to the kitchen. The kitchen chars them down, creates a citrus ash as a garnish for their dishes. Um, man, there's so much. You know, uh, atomization of oils. We don't we don't use twists. I atomize oils on everything except the martini because that's just a martini. Um, and it deserves the respect that martini deserves. Yeah, so we atomize oils of all types, lemon, grapefruit, lime. Um, do as little to, to throw away as possible. Um, we have a compost program, so you know, we don't really throw stuff away with compost. We don't have any sort of, uh, behind the bar at least, I can't speak for the kitchen, but behind the bar we don't use plastic wrap. Everything is, we, have, we buy bottles that are threaded so we can buy tops for them. Thank you, Mike Ryan. And, um, <laughs> um, you know, all the juice bottles are, are have corks, so we never use plastic wrap behind the bar. And it's not, it's sustainable, it's good, but also it's so cost efficient. The, the financials behind sustainability is what we should really be pushing. Because the idea of like how many lines you throw away when you don't have to, you can just stay hydrated. They're even they're beautiful, right? You know, don't throw away flavor. So it's nice. Hi, hello. So I'm really excited to be doing this sustainability challenge outside in this beautiful, beautiful weather. And uh, I brought some extra, some extra foliage too in case we didn't have enough all around us. Uh, but when I first got this challenge, I wanted to make sure to explore all the kinds of ways that people were producing at bars. Because 
I will say that one of the main things about no waste is that there's really not a one-size-fits-all solution and you really have to kind of do a lot of research for what works for your bar and often the effort and cost that goes into no waste measures can be substantial. So once I heard back from a few friends about what waste they were experiencing, I tried to focus on stuff that was common across a lot of bars and that wouldn't totally change up your prep game. So um, the waste I'm trying to eliminate today is ingredient scraps, including citrus shells, um, also uh, ice. So I am using no ice in either cocktail, and well, I'm using ice, but you'll see what I mean in a second. <laughs> Not ice in your traditional sense. Um, so I really wanted to celebrate two different ingredients that work really well in kettle. And the first one I went with is a strawberry because it's more on the accessible side. It's more mundane, it's more accessible. And then I, on the other side, I went with a Thai coconut, it's more exotic. I wanted to show that across many different types of bars, you can do these kinds of things. And there's different ways to accomplish it. And if you get creative, it really isn't gonna be that difficult. So uh, with the strawberries, I cut off the tops first, and which would normally be discarded, and I put them in some chinar. Strawberries work really well with kettle because it's this creamy kind of berries and cream effect. And because kettle's pot distilled, it has such a really nice, nice body and texture, and that works so well with berries. And so I put the tops in some chinar because to me that like bitter flavor really brings those two together. Six and uh, the herbal notes <coughs> for the strawberry tops actually bring a really cool, cool note to the chinar. So I combined kettle one with that strawberry chinar. Top chainer, should I say? And uh, I also use no citrus in any of these cocktails, so I'm going to be using citric acid. And uh, also, a lot of the fruit I'm using brings acids to the cocktail, so it doesn't actually need as much citrus, anyways. So, just a little bit of citric acid goes a long way. Now, the main part of the strawberries, I threw those into ice trays and I froze them into cubes and that's actually what we're going to be shaking the cocktail on today. On top of that, we also have some citric acid in here in place of citrus, but again, it's like a quarter ounce or less. Really just a little bit. Three minutes. Also added some PX sherry for a little bit of richness and toastiness, again, to bring out the toasty notes in the kettle. Orange flower water. And 
inside of the coconut is what's going to be our cubes today to blend the cocktail on. So you really get not only the really unctuous umami from the flesh, but you get the refreshing water as well, and that's the dilution of the cocktail. that is near and dear to my heart. Being a conscientious consumer, say that 10 times fast, um, is something that I really believe in. It's why all summer long, I do as much of my shopping as possible at farmer's markets. It's why we recycle and compost at home. It's why I've been a vegetarian for over 15 years, something I actually don't talk about a whole lot. Um, but it's also near and dear to me because it's a part of my heritage. So uh, my family is Israeli, and you may not know this, but Israel is actually one of the most progressively green countries there are. I took for granted as a kid that I would walk around Tel Aviv and there was a recycling bin on every corner, that all of the food was local, and that every hot water heater was powered by the sun, which was actually put into law all the way back in 1980. So today I'm gonna be making you some drinks that have the flavors of my heritage, but also draw inspiration from the creative solutions that they find and that I'm gonna to find today to the problems that, that we face. And of course, there's no better spirit to be doing this with than Kettle One. 
that beautiful windmill in Skidam is is not just for show, though when I was there a couple years ago, they put on this awesome light show on it. It does actually power, uh, it takes about 20% of the power for the distillery. Another 20% is from solar panels, and the rest is all certified green energy that they're buying in. And then of course that winter wheat that they're using is all local, um, all, all local to Holland as well. But the issue that I'm gonna really kind of talk about today is citrus. Especially for those of us in the Northeast, citrus is not exactly a sustainable product. It's a huge carbon footprint to get citrus all the way up there. And today I'm not gonna tell you that we shouldn't use citrus. I think we absolutely should have fresh citrus in our bars. It would be almost inhospitable not to. But there are things we can do to make sure that we are using the whole fruit and utilizing it to its fullest. And also ways that we can kind of decrease our reliance on that, on that fresh citrus as well, to be using less and to decrease our carbon footprint. So the first drink I'm making for you is a celebration of citrus, kind of a celebration of citrus and fire. I'm using the Catawan Citron, which has a blend of four different lemons plus two limes just to freshen it up in here. as well as a burnt sugar syrup, some nice fresh lemon juice, a touch of amaro, and then just a little bit of tahina or tahini. Which amaro is it? Huh? Which amaro is it? Uh, it is Santa Maria Al Monte. Five minutes. This is gonna be an egg white drink as well, but we're not going to waste that yolk. I'm actually going to be using that yolk to make a ricotta aioli, which is going to go right on top of a gazpacho for you. Now, the way that we're using the whole lemon in this drink is actually with the garnish. I'm gonna to be topping it off with something called lemon ash. Sorry about the noise. Um, ricotta aioli with za'atar in it. And I'm going to just drizzle a little bit of it or put a little dollop right on top of this gazpacho for you too. Uh, Jackson, I'm going to leave yours without for you, unless you would like some. Okay. Um, but it's with, the, uh, it's with the garnish that we are going to create um, using the whole cocktail. I made something called lemon ash. Lemon ash uses those, those hulls of the lemon after you're done juicing them in a different creative way. I essentially just burn them, turn them to charcoal, and then pulverize it, and that's gonna be going right on top of our drink. With utilizing all the parts, giving the yolks to the kitchen, there's also things we can take back from the kitchen. When we're creating our own custom cocktails, this is our opportunity to step away from using fresh citrus a little bit. So I'm gonna be using um, a product that is Acid Way. Acid Way is essentially the byproduct of making a soft cheese, like a ricotta or yogurt. There's actually a, a huge problem in the industrial yogurt industry in terms of what to do with their Acid Way, but it's a great alternative acid for bartenders to use. I did add just a touch of citric acid in there just to kind of brighten it that much more as well as help um, extend the shelf life of it. Um, definitely has a longer shelf life than, than fresh lemon and lime juice, but still has one. Um, so that's a great byproduct from the kitchen. We're using another byproduct from the kitchen Three with minutes. a um, stem syrup, a tomato stem syrup. So something usually that just gets thrown away. We're using our flagship kettle one for a little black pepper flavor in there as well. I picked some uh, herbs for your gazpacho. And so these stems are actually going right in for this guy. And then just a touch of green harissa as well. one I am shaking it up with, with regular ice but for the second one we're actually using another byproduct I strain the tomato water off the tomatoes before making your gazpacho today and turn that into ice to create a little more tomato flavor but also so that we're not using any water in this guy all right it's gonna shake it up for you yeah. Woo.
glasses so that the ice would, uh, would last a little longer and, and we're going to just be able to reuse that ice as well. So this guy I'm calling from the ashes. One minute thirty. This is your lemon ash over the top. I prefer it as a, uh, oh, the wind's going a little bit, as a um, garnish because it has all of these beautiful aromatics to it. And for our from the vine, I'm giving it just a little bit of a, of a half rim with sumac salt. Sumac also has a really a nice kind of fresh, fresh flavor to it. Um, a little bit almost citrusy as well. So we're just gonna kind of play and get a little bit more high notes out of this drink that doesn't have any fresh citrus in it. small little changes that we can make in our bars every day just like as an individual being a conscientious consumer can add up to something greater so can the little things we do in our bar thank you Part of the tomato, every part of the herbs um, in there as well. Um, plus, of course, the egg yolk being utilized with the ricotta that we used away from. So, so they really kind of all all get go hand in hand. checking some headlines in NewYorkTimes.com, and one in particular really stood out to me. Wrath of coastal erosion destroys Senegal fishing hub. It explained how rising sea levels as a result of climate change, there were actually awesome photos, and it was a really great piece of photojournalism. Uh, rising sea levels as a result of climate change are not only leading to coastal erosion, but destroying a working class neighborhood. And while the beautiful town of San Luis, Senegal, may seem like more than even half a world away, it's sadly a harbinger of what is soon to come much closer to home. So the American South, the region that I'm representing today, Alabama, contains more miles of coastline than any other region in the country. And as such, it's the re region most vulnerable to one of the most immediate effects of climate change, which is rising sea levels. If we don't immediately move to drastically reduce the amount of waste that we're producing, precariously positioned coastal cities such as New Orleans, Miami, and Charleston may be underwater and uninhabitable within the next century. So this is where eco-minded spirits companies can step in to do their part. The spirits industry in particular is notorious for its rampant use of electricity and for the amount of waste that it produces. For every liter of spirits produced, 13 liters of waste are also produced. However, Kettle One, as part of a larger portfolio-wide effort by Diageo, is really doing its part to make sure that we can continue to enjoy its products into the future. So, Kettle One's been a leader in sustainable spirits production since the 80s when uh, Carl Millet Sr. started to install special air filters onto the exhaust vents at the distillery to reduce and eliminate CO2 and other toxins released into the atmosphere of Skidam. And then his sons, Bob and Carl Jr., took up his mantle when they outfitted the windmill from something that was beautiful but non-functional into an actual source of power production, installed a private tunnel in between the distillery and the distribution center, reducing the need for trucks, and then also have been focusing recently on a water reduction plan, making sure that Kettle One uses significantly less water and also contributes to giving, uh, providing water and sanitation to those in need and most likely to be first hit by the effects of climate change. So as someone who's about to open their first bar, ah, this isn't as scary as that is. Um, <laughs> as someone who's about to open her first bar, I wanted to look at this, not just from the perspective of reusable kind of like coasters and glassware and straws, because we're already doing that, 
but from a micro and macro perspective business-wise. So from a micro's perspective to start off with, I wanted to think about what I'm using specifically, pardon if I reach, what we're using specifically in my bar that's um, really contributing to, to waste. So um, the first thing that came to mind for me was the pineapple, right? We use, you know, the, the juice to make, or the, the fruit to make juice or garnishes and the fronds, of course, but beyond that, we're not actually doing too much with it. So I know this is your wheelhouse, Kate, but um, I promise I'm not gonna touch anything that was yours. Um, specifically, I started off with the peels, and to me, the first thing that I wanted to do with that was, again, find a way to reuse the peels, and I found a pretty elegant solution that, in my opinion, I prefer better than a shrub. It's going to be making tepache, which is a traditional fermented beverage from Mexico. You can jazz it up with some spices, but really all you need to put in that is going to be the skins, water, and a little bit of sugar, which is what I've done today. Uh, my boyfriend over here will be the first one to tell you that I'm not so great in the kitchen, um, and I actually burnt the bejesus out of some pineapple when I was r and ding this drink. But I, uh, in the spirit of eco-mindedness, also wanted to incorporate that, so I made it into a rich syrup. It's super dark and unctuous, and Kettle One Vodka is actually the perfect base for this. Kettle One not only is going to add some beautiful texture to this traditional tiki cocktail, but it's also going to really lengthen and extend flavors that might otherwise be like too intense, you know? Like you put on your tongue, you're like, whoa, turn the dial down from 11. Kettle's gonna help make it a little less intense. Four minutes. After that, of course, there's going to be pineapple pulp infused Oloroso sherry. That's just going to add again some kind of raisinated fruits and nutty elements. There's going to be Angostura bitters, as well as a little bit of lime juice. And just to jog your memory, guys, here's a little menu I made for everyone. Sorry, Jackson, I'm right there right now. Um, it's going to make a beautiful kind of tiki-esque cocktail that really, to me, tastes like vacation in a glass. I'm going to garnish it not only with pineapple fronds, but I'm also going to add uh, a little bit of dehydrated pineapple, which is a great way to kind of use up maybe the base or the top of a pineapple. You can kind of cut these off from that. And then finally, something really cool that I'm going to guarantee you guys have never seen before. So, kind of, well, hopefully you haven't seen before and I'm scared. Charles just gave me a look. Um, <laughs> but pineapple katsuboshi. So this is the product that's used on skipjack tuna to create um, bonito flakes. And I actually used it on pineapple, resulting in something that doesn't actually ever need to be refrigerated. I mean, Minutes. Not a ton is coming off here, but that's really all you need. It's going to add just kind of like a smoky element. Pardon my finger. Um, it's going to add a kind of smoky element to the drink. It's going to play off those really nice fruit flavors. So, from a macro perspective, um, do you guys know how much the average restaurant produces in waste every year? Anyone? Tell us. So I didn't know, and my it was very embarrassing what I thought it was versus what it what actually was, but it's about 100,000 pounds. So the neighborhood that I work in right now in Birmingham called Southside contains a ton of bars and restaurants that probably produce over 4 million pounds of waste per annum. So I wanted to think about this from a macro perspective. What if we all contributed to making one cocktail using all of that waste? Reduce, reuse, and recycle. So first off, I started off at Five Points Oyster House, which is connected to a fine dining seafood restaurant. Uh, they obviously shuck a lot of oysters, and so I took the tops of those oyster shells and infused them into the Kettle One, which created this really beautiful kind of saline, oceanic quality, but then also uh, kind of added that nice kind of linear, almost limestone thing, kind of like a Chablis, right? That's a wine call that we get when we have wine that comes from oyster, formerly oyster-rich soil. I next moved on to Dave's Pub, which is where I currently work. It's a 22-year-old dive bar. We like set the ceiling on fire and do karaoke on Thursdays. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, I started as a wine buyer about a year ago, and so we've really upped our wine game, which is great. But we still have about uh, a bottle total left over at the end of the week. So I took all of that, added some herbs and spices, as well as some dehydrated lemons and orange peels that we also use for garnish there now. And I made my own vermouth. It's uh, fortified with a little bit of fino sherry. And then finally, at uh, Surin, which is another block away. It makes some of the best sushi in Birmingham. I know, it's Birmingham sushi, but we do have a coastline in Alabama. Um, he makes really great nigiri that's wrapped with a little piece of nori or dried seaweed, and those little pieces result in a ton of scraps that I collected, and I infused into verju to make a kind of brine. One minute. This is gonna result in a play on one of my favorite cocktails, which is a dirty 50-50 martini. And to top it off, normally I would put a little bit Normally, I would put a little bit of um, lemon zest on this. However, in the case of this cocktail, I wanted to think about waste. So I collected lemon zest from the recent James Beard Award winning Highlands restaurant after they'd expressed it for Sazerac's. 
and I infused it into Kettle One, and then I cut that with seconds. water that I made a tea out of using zested lemons. So it's shelf stable, lasts forever, and you definitely get way more lemon oil out of this than you would from normally just expressing and discarding a lemon peel. So, two cocktails showing us not only that waste created drinks can be delicious, and pad your bottom line as a restaurant owner, but especially in the case of the macro one, they not only encourage customer encouragement, but they also bring together a community to create something bigger than what we are. So with every sip, thanks to Kettle One, the cute future is looking a little brighter. Cheers. Woo. I kind of boiled and scrubbed those down, and then I just poured Kettle One over it for a 24-hour infusion, fine strained it. And then the um, remove, if you'd like to taste. It's going to be a little gentian heavy. I personally made these drinks, I mean, to my palate, just so you guys would know what I, what I like. Um, I prefer something that's bitter and like pretty clean and dry on the end. And again, infused with peanut sugar. Um, everybody ready? So ready. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah. Eight minutes starts now. Great. Yes. Hello, hello. Uh, for those who haven't met, uh, my name is Casey Miller. I come from a little bar named, um, called The Last Word in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, today I'm going to make you two cocktails, uh, really, really trying to, to reduce waste. Um, because it's, it's such a problem in this industry. I, I, I have a lot of experience in the service industry, even though I haven't been behind the bar that long. Um, I worked as a sushi chef uh, for a couple of years, and I was also working in catering. And one of the things that really stuck out that stuck out to me was just how much waste we go through on a nightly basis. I mean, especially especially in the sushi restaurant, um, with their emphasis on fresh ingredients. Like, if it's a day, and it's it's got to be gone after that. So. Because uh, the last word actually shares a wall with a sushi restaurant, I've been building a, a kind of relationship with them over the last several months. And once I heard that this, uh, this round was coming out, I really wanted to try to use that relationship and see if I could utilize some of their waste ingredients uh, in a cocktail that I'm gonna be putting on the menu this summer. Um, and this is actually going to be this cocktail over here called the conveyor belt, um, after a conveyor belt sushi and the whole kind of concept of recycling. Uh, and so this cocktail is going to be utilizing Kettle One. Uh, it's a strong functional, functional base, um, great, great mixing spirit, um, and it's really going to kind of prop up the other ingredients uh, that I'm going to put in. So, start with a bit of Kettle One vodka. Next, we're going to utilize a bit of plum wine that I got from the sushi restaurant. Uh, they have a policy where after three days they toss their wine, and I said, why? Even if it's oxidized. You can still utilize it in a cocktail, and actually sometimes it can get even better. This is a syrup that I made from strawberries that we are we, are, we were already making a syrup out of at the bar, and so after we would just dump this. So I took this, took those strawberries and some uh, some shiso leaves from next door that they use for garnish, but they don't use very use them very much, and so they toss quite a bit on a night, on a weekly basis. So a strawberry shiso syrup. Six minutes. Thank you and a bit of uh, what I call rind juice. Uh, this one is made to mimic lime, uh, lime juice, and it is uh, the halves of limes that we generally toss when we're prepping garnish at the beginning of every night behind the bar. I've been chucking them into a, a little cooler. Um, and a, a blend of uh, citric and malic acid, with an emphasis on malic, because citric has more uh, lemon notes, and malic has more uh, lime notes. And this is just a bit of salted plum, so all these ingredients that I'm putting in both this cocktail and the next one that I'll talk to you about in a bit um, are all either upcycled from my bar or the sushi restaurant next door, uh, or 
they have such a ridiculous shelf life. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine a situation where you would waste them. Uh, so, for example, the salted plum pass. I mean, this is going to last longer than me, probably. <laughs> Second cocktail is called the nashi kasu. It's a Japanese. The Japanese word for nashi. Or excuse me, the Japanese word for uh, a pear is nashi, and it's also the Japanese word for uh, none. And kasu is a slang term for waste, so uh, you're absolutely right. This entire challenge is so I can make a Japanese pun. Uh, <laughs> and we're utilizing Kettle One Citron uh, for this one. Uh, great blend of uh, different citruses uh, from three different continents, a blend of uh, you know limes, limes from the Caribbean, lemons from uh, Sicily and Africa, and then uh, that's our base. We're going to use a little bit of Asian pear infused sake, once again from the sushi restaurant next door. Uh, this is another rind juice that I made, but with a little bit more of an emphasis on uh, uh, the citric acid. And also, when we trim up our uh, lemon garnishes for, uh, for, uh, for prep every night. Um, once again, just kind of tossing those into a little uh, container of water, letting them soak, um, and at the end of the shift, mixing it with some citric acid, a little tartaric, a little malic. This right here is some local honey from one of my best friend's mothers, who uh, has her own bees. And I put a little bit of uh, orange and lemon rind in there, once again from the bar, to kind of make my own little uh, marzipan. And a little bit of uh, aquafaba, if you're familiar with this concept. Uh, it's basically the, uh, the, the water that garbanzo beans or chickpeas soak in. And we actually serve those at the bar, fried chickpeas. And we don't really have a use for the, uh, the water. And so I was like, well, why don't, why don't we find a use for it? Um, there's proteins in there. It's going to give it a nice kind of fluffy uh, aspect to the cocktail, light and fluffy. Charles, I think you judged the uh, Giancarlo last year for nationals. We still have the drink that he made for you on our menu, and he makes uh, we make a syrup, the Pilonchillo syrup for the Estrella Negra, uh, the Mexico round. And so those spices we normally toss out, um, so they're kind of coated in, in sugar. And so I'm just gonna caramelize that sugar and roast the spices at the same time and add that to the cocktail. Once again, those spices, ridiculous shelf life. If you'd like a, kind of a hint of what these flavor profiles are going to be, please help yourself to, uh, to some sushi. I made that um, about 20 minutes ago, so it should be, should be all, all fresh. So we're starting to. Um, it's an ingredient that we've tried to put on, especially because in Ann Arbor, we have a lot of vegetarian and vegan customers, so it's cool to be able to have that ingredient if someone orders and if they want an egg white sour, but you know, without any egg white, it's a great replacement. You have a bunch left over if you're doing that snack at your bar. Exactly, yeah. So it's like it's just it's a product that we would have on hand all the time. Uh, this is a little bit of a ginger beer that I fermented uh, this week. Um, it's a blend of ginger that we, we have on hand to make penicillins and things like that. Uh, but also I tossed in a bit of uh, the sushi ginger, the gutty, that you get. Um, so it has a little bit of a salinity, uh, which I think is just kind of rounds out the cocktail. A blend of kind of sweet, savory, and sour notes. 30 seconds.
were curious, these trails are by
It's also allowing bartenders to stay in the industry a little bit more when you don't have the cold draft ice beating up our bodies. And the more veteran bartenders hopefully will stay in this industry and be able to pass knowledge along to the older ones, not only on bartending, service, professionalism, but also on why we're here today. What was that? Four minutes. Four minutes, thank you. And pass on kind of this lineage and this information. This second cocktail I have for you is also going to be using Scotsman. Um, and we are going to do it with. So also talking about fruits, vegetables, agriculture, I wanted both of these cocktails to be very heavy on kind of homemade products, syrups, and um, water that's already going to agriculture and how we use them. So in the first cocktail, you have strawberry and you have celery. Those are the strawberry syrup I made from home and brought. And those are actually coming from farms that are practicing sustainability. And it's also using products that you can then juice, you can then blend and taking those pulps and putting them to compost. Sacramento has this amazing company that's called Resoil Sacramento. They come around to bars and restaurants. It's a nonprofit. And they actually pick up all of our compost and take them um, to different farms, especially other nonprofits that are either teaching people how to farm or to school education programs. So they are doing an incredible amount um, just by showing up every day and picking up the things that other, otherwise we would waste. Other things that we are doing are we are putting together, you know, glass rinsers and bars now, which are a lot more efficient than just letting the top run to wash tins. So again, this first cocktail, Kettle Citron. Kettle Citron and, excuse me, really. Um, Kettle Citron, fresh pressed celery juice, Aperol, strawberry syrup, a little bit of bubbles in there, and black pepper. The second cocktail is going to be kettle, which is the base, and just having the Nolets family being part of it and just their lineage coming over in 1979 to really see what the American drink culture was like and doing three years of experimentation to make sure that their product was on key for what was going on, especially being from the West Coast. It's first bottle <laughs> being sold in Fix, which is, has a beautiful, beautiful bar actually made by boat, uh, people who make boats and giant ships, so it could actually fit in, and being part of this as well. So I think through our bar programs and through sustainability, if we continue to really appreciate agriculture and what that brings and the watersheds, that it's dependent on and continuing to develop water catches that are sustainable and supportive and that actually go along with our our growing market would be great just to top this off nice and cold out here a little half ounce of soda water in each one so got a champagne cocktail to my right your left a little soda water on opposite one. Uh, these sprays as well, let's refresh this one, is going to be Earl Grey. There's a little bit of fresh Earl Grey right here. I also still decided to use glass because glass is easily purchasable, it is easily made, whereas using the whole fruit for the grapefruit with the grapefruit so if you even been here, what are you doing with your holes other than composting them, maybe being able to use them? And also straws, not metal straws that still have a lot of minerals and a lot of mining to create, but something that's bamboo forward and having a more simplistic with clay, bamboo, and banana leaves in here to be completely sustainable.
you all so much for hanging out with us and sitting outside in the hot sun today. Uh, it's not Texas heat, so I'm actually feeling quite comfortable. I'm assuming you're from Texas. I am from Texas, from Houston. Um, so in this challenge, uh, when I started thinking about what it is, that, what made this whole challenge what it is, um, I took a very micro look at what, what, like, what was going on in my bar. Um, so my bar, we sell two times as many old fashions as any other cocktail in our bar. So we're constantly peeling oranges because that's the way we do ours. So we have tons of leftover oranges that don't get used for anything, and we quite honestly throw them away. Now, as far as like a, a carbon footprint, they do take up some space, but they are decomposable. So like I didn't see like I was like this is not sure in the world. But I mean, it's, this is more of a way of like for us to reutilize these things that we would normally just throw away and try to help like our bottom line. I want to be a bar owner sometime soon, and so that's kind of one of the things I'm looking for. So in doing all this, I took. A whole bunch of things, and like I used the lemons and oranges that we have left, left over from juicing and, and peels, and made a bunch of different things that go in. So um, I'm gonna go and start off with um, my stirred boozy cocktail, which is actually called the fifth generation. So what I've done here is I've made a vermouth substitute for us. So I've taken the orange peels that, from juicing, I've dehydrated them, along with lemon peels as well, dehydrated those, and I infuse those into um, a white port. Um, I want to make it sweeter because I know these are gonna throw off some really bitter like. Um, and then I, on the side, I made a couple of tinctures. So an angelica root tincture, which is the most common ingredient used in vermouths, as well as a little bit of coriander, which has fruitiness and lightness, and a little bit of anise seed for the that, that anise flavor. Um, then I blended them all separately to create what, what I have here. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just add a little bit to the base. And this cocktail is based off of the 50-50 martini. It's actually more like a 49-51 martini, honestly. Um, this does come up a little bit sweet because it does have the wet cord in it, so I needed a little bit more, a little bit more uh, of the, uh, the kettle one to go in. Now this cocktail is called the fifth generation because uh, this during the fifth generation of the kettle one distillery, uh, they they milled the whale, which is their their mill to mill the grains that they were receiving. So it was a way of, for them being more efficient and, and uh, using the things that they had, and then also being like. Resourceful, kind of like what we're trying to do here. So, um, in that respect as well, uh, being resourceful, I was thinking of ways that, like, instead of just using plastic glassware, we decided to use some of the kettle one bottles that I've done in my experiment. As you can see, uh, the upside down version of this cocktail is actually the top of the kettle one bottle. I had a local glassblower cut them for me and uh, fodder peel them so they're nice and, nice and easy on there. Um, It was a very last minute um, favor, and uh, so they were they were done to the best of their ability. And then for the garnish, in juicing the oranges, went ahead and dehydrated the pulp. So we have a little bit of dehydrated pulp on there. And then with some of the oranges that we had left over, uh, that had a little bit more peel on them, I infused those into vodka and I created an orange essence. Instead of peeling more oranges to put on top of something that I was using the orange peels to fix a problem, I decided to make my own essence. So again, a little bit of orange oil on top of here. And that is the fifth generation for you guys. Cool. And uh, now the next cocktail is gonna be uh, the Comeback King. Uh, now, this is literally a line strictly stolen right off the Kettle One website, I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, but it does actually pertain to this cocktail. So, um, once again, the whole idea of like the comeback and like taking things back from what we used to be. Um, I took the juiced oranges, that I made the pulp from here, and I made a soda out of them. So I dehydrated, uh, well, excuse me, go back. I clarified the orange juice, the pulp then made those garnishes, and then the rinds that was left over from that, I made a citrus stock. I'm sure you've heard that the, 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 the citrus stock that everyone's done today, uh, but Trash Tiki is one of some cool friends of ours that gave me some ideas for that, so we did an orange stock on there. Acid corrected with citric and malic acid, um, as well as a tiny bit of sugar. So that's the acid. And then I took that, mixed it with a little bit of water, and uh, carbonated it. Added a little bit of vanilla because I like vanilla cream soda, it's one of my favorite things as a kid. And then, so the cocktail has a little bit of lemon in it, um, 
some Galliano. Um, I've been a big fan of Galliano, uh, being that it was one of like you know kind of back with the comeback kid thing, something that we necessarily don't see all the time. Um, really wanted to bring like that, that Galliano kind of orange combo, not necessarily a uh, a Harvey Wallbanger, but something kind of in that thing. So. big problems so when I was talking with Ian, um, one of the guys from uh, Trash Tiki, he said that for me to think about the water usage that I'm doing. So being that we love all these beautiful like large large cubes, they do waste a lot of water when they're doing them. So I'm going to, oops, actually, before I do that, before I drink, my soda, the important part. <laughs> And I did bottle this to try and reduce how many things I was using and trying to reuse those bottles. But I tasted the soda and it did go a little bit flat. So I wanted to make sure that I gave y'all that. <laughs> all the bubbles. Two minutes. Two minutes, right? Um, we're doing an ounce and a half of this soda. Whoa-ish. I'm gonna go eyeball this now. Josh got me all scared with the two minute pull. Just about ounce and a half on both those. Now again, back to the whole water thing. So we're going to strain these off, and then we're going to reuse the ice that we use to shake to fill the glasses. And again, since <laughs> since we did use um, oh, that, that really nice thing. since we did use the tops, we're going to go ahead and use the bottoms for the glassware for these as well. So again, trying to use as many parts of the things as we possibly can. And then for this cocktail. I took some of those other oranges, you can see on the outside they're kind of peeled from the things that we didn't use in the bar, dehydrated those and using those as garnish, something we normally would have thrown away. And then metal straws for sustainability going along with that, uh, One minute. just to make sure that we all are responsible and not giving plastic to marine life. Alright guys, and here you are is the uh, comeback key. Actually, we're going to get a little time. Combat King gets his name a little bit more from the Kettle One story because uh, post prohibition during the 80s, um, the. I'm going to butcher his name. Uh, Carlos, Carlos reinvented uh, Kettle One, reinventing it with doing the copper pot still mixed in with the column still and brought it back to the market in 1984. Um, and, and that was when the, the term the Combat King started because they wanted to make sure that they brought it back slow and brought Kettle One back into the market. So that's a little bit further in the name of that. Yes, thank you all so much, and please hope you all enjoy. Hi guys, thanks so much for having me. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Alexis Mejares, and I'm from Austin, Texas. Um, I currently work. Thank you. I like that one. I currently work at the Fairmont, which uh, in Austin is the second largest hotel in the state of Texas. So when we're talking about sustainability and think about things, it's a very large scale, and it can be quite a task to take on, especially if you think about it being like a five-star hotel, excess is really easy to just kind of hold as a crutch. Um, I'm really proud to say that our programming is particularly environmentally friendly. I actually am part of our environmental club, so we have an acting group within the hotel that is really sustainable and focused. Uh, so getting this challenge was like especially exciting for me. Uh, it felt really right up my alley and things that are really important to me already. Um, with that in mind, we have 1,042 rooms in our hotel and we have six beverage outlets. So if you're thinking about it on a large scale, waste is huge. Trying to find opportunities to um, address that waste can be a humongous task. So I took a really practical approach, I think, to this challenge in a way that these are these are things that I implement in our bar program. These are things that we're thinking about all the time with ways to like, continue um, structuring a more eco-friendly Program. So I'm going to start uh, with my first cocktail, which is actually going to be pre-bottled. So this cocktail is going to contain Kettle One as its base. It's got a little bit of a Hispanic inspiration. I've spent a good amount of time down in Tulum helping with the bar program there. And one of the greatest things that I took away from working in uh, Mexican bar programs is that you have to like give back all of the bottles that you're using. So you can't get another 24 pack of beer unless you bring all the bottles back or the majority of them before they give you a new one down there. And I really love that approach. So in Texas, if you don't know, Topo Chico is humongous. Uh, we go through quite a lot of it. And I wanted to find a fun way. Um, one of my biggest sustainability issues, I think, in our hotel is that we don't run the gun system. So 
on average, in my bar alone, we probably go through three to four cases of Topo Chico a day. So if you're times number six, that's a, on a slow day, like a pallet, right? So um, repurposing the cocktail back into its bottle using a draft system where we're utilizing uh, citrus from the day before, not necessarily tossing it because we're able to fortify it with liquor, uh, using what I call a cut cordial. So we're taking like the trims of garnishes and stems of mint and um, parts of things that we're juicing and repurposing that into like an oleo sort. We're gonna have um, a little bit of uh, Campari, Ancho Reyes, uh, Chirandas Blanco, which is a Mexican rum from Michoacan. Um, again, kettle as its base, a little bit of lime, pineapple, and uh, repurposed Topo Chico. So I'm going to start you guys off with that. You'll find the recipe on the back too, so you can see exactly the measurements that are in this cocktail. My second cocktail is called Yellow Bird. This cocktail um, contains yellow chartreuse, so the name kind of comes from that, and then also kind of inspired by the windmills of Kettle One, um, and kind of birds flying, and all the wind, and how that's really important, I think. It was a lot of fun for me creating this cocktail. So, we're gonna start with a little bit of lemon juice. Uh, another item that you're gonna find that gives a beautiful color that first cocktail is I'm making like a high mecca. So we do a passion fruit kind of tea in the house, so a hibiscus. I take that concentrated and repurpose that to, to put back into this cocktail. I did a lot of tea focus because I think there's some major things that we can address there. Uh, this cocktail as well is going to use a tea syrup, with, uh, a black tea, so taking like iced tea that we would normally dump for the day and actually reducing it down and then creating a syrup out of it. We do, yeah, but now we're trying to find, you know, positive ways to simple to that. What I think is really lovely about as craft cocktails become more consumer focused and like more of the norm and less of like you have to go and seek them out is that there's opportunity to maybe take a little bit of that precision away. I've worked in small programs and done great sustainability in those too and I don't know, I'd love to nerd out about cocktails, but I think there's a place too, especially high volume, huge hotel where you have to keep in mind that like you have to you have not cut corners but find new solutions. So like for me I think ice is a huge thing, especially in a large scale. If I'm making six, seven hundred drinks a day, if I'm using different ice that I'm shaking with, it seems very wasteful to me. I don't find that ice to really be as dirty as like some people will call it. Um, and I think we're getting into that approach of cocktails where it can be like friendly and approachable. So this cocktail is going to kind of address that as well. We're going to have a little bit of coconut rum, just for fun. And petal citron. I also wanted to address garnish waste. So particularly in a large hotel, we go through either a lot of garnish or we expect to go through a lot of garnish and then the occupancy is low and you know we deal with that. So we've also started taking uh, citrus from the night before and dehydrating it. So we're taking dehydrated citrus as a garnish base. As well as we do a tincture for another cocktail, which is based off of coconut, uh, pink peppercorn, and salt, um, where I've actually then extracted once it's reached its flavor and then dehydrated it to create kind of like a salt coconut peppercorn rim. I appreciate you guys' time. Again, I really want to take practical approaches to everything. I think uh, sustainability, certainly in smaller programs, you can think a lot more like nerdy and tiny, but I work in a large scale program. And it's things that every bartender who works there, whether they have a high craft background or maybe more like a high volume background, we can come together, find these solutions together, create really delicious drinks in a really approachable, easy way to do so. 
So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Um, Oh, three, yeah. two, oh, sorry. Oh, Let go. Everybody ready? So, so ready. 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 Last competitor, Jorge Vargas. So Here we go. Ready. Eight minutes starts now. Okay, welcome judges uh, to the Club One uh, Sustainability Zero Waste Lab. Uh, my name is Jorge Vargas Paquerano from San Jose, California. We're going to talk about <laughs> green, to be green and zero waste. Um, the knowledge family, uh, uh, they did a lot of stuff going on for, for sustainability and in, in, in whole process. and. Uh, they uh, use beautiful products uh, uh, to, to keep us uh, in zero waste. And in 2005, they built a 141 foot tall right here a windmill that actually produce uh, green energy to the to the distillery uh, and also support the community within Skid and Holland. So in two cocktails and in eight minutes probably, I'm gonna try to uh, show you some uh, aspect that we can uh, bartenders could contribute to this zero waste uh, movement. In our, in our community. Um, bartenders are very wasteful, we have to be honest. And, uh, and then try to cover some, some aspect. So it's gonna be uh, citrus on fruit husk, uh, wine, and also our cover food breaks. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the citrus husk on footprints, it's gonna be more about uh, uh, how we can just basically a repurpose the product all the time, no? So I'm starting in my bar to do a, a closed loop cocktails to use all the, the whole product in one. Uh, I've done uh, um, lemons, you know, with uh, lemon peel, volume saccharone with the peelers, and then dehydrate it and then caramelize it. So a lot of stuff going on. But now I wanna, I wanna use uh, the pineapple that is actually a signature of hospitality right here. <laughs> and then this guy is gonna have to do the whole thing. So when you just basically press the, the, the pineapple, you sir, you have the juice, but then uh, you have the leftovers, right? Uh, that little paste, the pulp, but it is actually uh, dehydrated. I make a little bit of pineapple chips that are gonna be presented for you guys. But what about the skin? Uh, the skin is gonna be, uh, uh, I made a uh, tepache. Tepache, if you guys don't know, is actually a fermented drink from Mexico and Latin America. They can use the whole the skin. Uh, 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 cinnamon and black pepper on it, and, uh, and that, uh, you can even reuse it again. And they have like a seven days or eight days to patch it. Uh, also, the most of people waste a lot. I think I have a big uh, wine selection. It's wine, right? Uh, after four days, and then uh, uh, you gotta throw it away because it reached the prime. But uh, we can bartend it and use it and send it to the kitchen. And actually, the, 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 the chef can do uh, a vinegar, but I made my own uh, fortified wine. Aromatize wine, you know, call it vermouth because that's how warm on it. So I put a, a, a lot of uh, uh, some uh, roots, herb, uh, tea, fruits, and I fortify with caravan orange. So that's gonna be my first cocktail right here. So all those aspects is gonna be in both cocktails. Uh, now, sustainability is also it's not sustainability for the community, it's gonna be for ourselves and also our community. For ourselves, try to keep it. Uh, and it's moving on low proof cocktail, right? So we're gonna take care of ourselves. So the next cocktail is actually gonna use Kerouan Orange and with a low proof spritzer in this style, right? And the same aspect that using the wine, I do a rosé wine, a fortified rosé wine, using hibiscus flower, uh, prunes, uh, leftover rosé wine, let's put it that way, and Kerouan Orange too. Uh, and also to support our community sustainability, is to uh, slow uh, uh, our cover footprints. You don't have to order products from another across the country. Just go to the to local farmers. You know, 20 minutes away from my house, there's a beautiful uh, farmers from strawberries in Watsonville, and it's 20 minutes from Jose. So I go over there and buy this beautiful strawberries and make a strawberry uh, syrup. Four minutes. And, uh, and, and actually, I can just help the community do uh, uh, more for them. select the ugly fruits right when you go to the market uh, whatever brand, uh, brand market uh, you can find these beautiful pro uh, fruits right very unique but when you go to local farmers you can just buy those ugly uh, uh, fruits 
that they are not gonna pass the standards of the regular grocery store. So what, what do they do? They throw it away. You can just basically contribute to, to, to the uh, farmers, right? And they, they can get more money, and uh, you don't waste a lot of energy in that. Three minutes. The same thing is, can I just... And then uh, it's gonna be in the second cocktail, uh, a nice beautiful spritzer using uh, the uh, fortify uh, wines, a little bit of pepper this time for aroma. Now we're good. Two minutes. So think about this. We're gonna we're gonna put a little bit of acid at the uh, at the end. You don't want to put any acid uh, on, the, on, the, on the shaker. Carbonation already add some. A little lemon juice on And it's gonna be for you guys really good because this hot temperature is everybody they're killing killing everyone right here. Don't think about sustainability, it's like for me, uh, sustain yourself with a low fruit cocktail, sustain your community uh, with a uh, 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 support your uh, local uh, farmers. Uh, they report for single products, close with cocktail with the pineapples, uh, right, in different ways. And uh, also, one minute, have some uh, beautiful strawberry chips for you guys here. Just that. Everything was left over from the making the syrups and making the juices. So there's no zero waste. You don't throw away all those uh, all the stuff. So the cocktails are the, the local <coughs> spritz because it's a local from Watsonville, San Jose area. And this is gonna be my everything and then some. So you have everything on the cocktail, but then you can add something else like the touch it, right? Leftover pineapple skins on it into it. So it's a lot of stuff that you can do for sustainability. It's just the the the, the, the heart that you have to put on it to make it better, right? 100% sustainability is very challenging, but at least we can just get there with many options. Thank and thank you so much for, for, for attending right here, Andy. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah.